Good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the Fleming. I'm Janie Cohen and I direct the museum and we are really thrilled to have you with us on this beautiful spring afternoon. Um, one quick announcement uh, before I introduce Beth. Introduce Beth. Um, Damien Elwes, who is an artist with a painting in, on that wall of um, Picasso's studio at Bateau Lavoir in 1908, will be speaking here um, Wednesday evening, April 1st. So just want to make sure that's in your heads and on your calendars. So um, this, as you know, the, this lecture tonight is in connection with the exhibition that we are sitting in the middle of, staring back. And I hope that um, if you haven't had time to see it yet, please come back. We do close at 7, so there won't be time afterwards. But please come back and spend some time in it. So I am really, really excited to introduce Beth Gersh Nesik, who is a friend and colleague um, in the Picasso world in New York City. She received her PhD in art history from um, City University of New York's Graduate Center. And her dissertation focused on Picasso's friend, um, the art critic and poet Andre Salmon. Um, Salmon was the only person who wrote, and uh, only person who had seen Demoiselle d'Avignon when Picasso first showed it to his friends and colleagues in 1907 and who wrote about it. Um, so Beth has translated Salmon's art criticism and his memoirs um, in collaboration with Jacqueline Gaujard, um, who is a, a professor emeritus um, taught at the Sorbonne for her career. And she is also the executor of Andre Salmon's estate. Um, and so Beth and Jacqueline continue to translate and, and publish in collaboration. Um, so in addition to André Salmon, Beth has published on Picasso, on Cubism, on other aspects of modern art. Um, she is a writer for About.com, for art history, the art history part of About.com. She has taught um, art history courses at SUNY Purchase since 90, 1997 and at Mercy College since 95, as well as at NYU, Simmons, and Rhode Island College. Um, last and certainly not least, she's founder and director of the New York Arts Exchange, which was she founded in 2003. Um, it's an arts education service that offers tours and lectures and workshops in various venues um, around primarily New York City, but not just, um, including museums and galleries, studio, artist studios, and arts organizations. So um, please join me in welcoming Beth Gersh Nessick. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Janie. This is really exciting. We've talked about this for a long time. This is, this is such a thrill to be here. And it's among, with Janie as a friend, and my friends work here. It's a thrill. And it's a beautiful show. I hope that you've taken a long time, played with all of the instruments that give you more information, and, and certainly uh, feel as though you know this painting better than ever. A little bit about the title of my talk, The Anecdotal History of Cuba, of, I did it, of the Demoiselle d'Avignon, is based on a chapter that André Samon wrote for his book called Young French Painting. And that chapter is a standard for art history students who study Cubism. It's the anecdotal history of Cubism. And most people know it chapter and verse. The point here is to channel André, among us and to think about what his two major aspects of this particular chapter, which talks about the young French artists of the period, what is he talking about with the Demoiselle? And Janie pointed out he was the only person among the group who decided to write about the, the Demoiselle. It was met with a great deal of consternation. It was shocking and most people didn't agree that this was a great 
work of art. It really took a lot of risk for his reputation. And let me tell you that his reputation, when he wrote this in 1912, was better known than Picasso. He was a critic who was writing about Picasso to talk up this young man and get a lot of attention. And he would write uh, things that weren't necessarily important, like he went on vacation or he uh, was walking in the street and this is what he said. So what are the two aspects of this painting that André Salmon talks about in this anecdotal history is number one, the painting itself that it was a new kind of painting. It had a new sense of composition, of color, of application. And next week, when Damien Elwes comes, I think he's going to talk about that because his work is about the birth of modern art. So I will leave it to Damien to discuss what we would call the formal aspects and the revolutionary aspects of that formal um, discussion, that thesis. And my thesis today is the other side of André Salmon's uh, description that this painting shocked with the appearance of the women, the, the idea that those faces, as he said, froze the half-converted. Now, what does he mean half-converted? Well, he says, because what we're used to deformation at this point. And I'm going to show you the history of the painting, the influences of the painting, so that you'll understand why this particular interpretation of women seem to be beyond the pale. So let us begin. It's January 1907. Epiphany, I think it was, actually, on the 6th. And we're looking at a painting that was revered at the time, but was reviled when it was first shown. Yes, it was, because you can see that her back is a little bit too long. She's a mannered nude. And at the beginning, when, on, when Ingres, Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres, had shown this, it was criticized for being a bit gothic. That was a, a pejorative word at the time. But this was beloved in 1907, and it belonged to the Louvre, which is, of course, the, the palace of great art in Paris. But the big surprise was that this Edward Manet Olympia was placed right next to it. And we have documentation in the newspapers that this was an outrage. This painting in 1863 was painted, but in 1865 was made public. It was put into a salon only because people thought that they had rained so many insults on Manet in 1963 that just let him be in the show. We don't want any more bad publicity. So it was skied. It was put very high so you wouldn't be able to see it in the salon. And that is the annual big exhibition in which the artists are supposed to be uh, revered. The point here is that this painting, which in 1865 was considered to be an outrage, was now placed side by side with was a painting that was now considered to be the great French tradition. All right. So side by side. Picasso, this little Spanish guy, looks at them and says, you know what? I am going to even be greater than these two men. I am going to have my own whores that are going to th throw the art world in a, a tizzy and become great. And that is, of course, my thesis. I'm not saying that actually went through his head. But we do know that Picasso was very competitive. And he was always looking for the way he was going to improve on the, the, um, the great artists he revered. And certainly Ingres, we have plenty of information about that, as well as Manet were among his favorites. But this was a challenge. It was like throwing down the glove. And he was going to meet that challenge with his own interpretation of the nude, and particularly of this kind of woman 
who is identifiable as on the left side, we're looking at an odalisque who is a member of the harem. And on the right side, we're looking at a prostitute. That was the outrage that you can definitely recognize a woman who is in a brothel and she is waiting for you. Now, against the backdrop of these two beautiful paintings that are hanging side by side, Picasso was wandering around the Louvre, and these are the classics. This is the standard for great French art in the past and to 1907 when he is looking at the uh, installation of the Olympia next to the Odalisque. We have, I chose just a few, a Hellenistic piece which is the Venus de Milo, you know, and certainly she stands for the classical beauty of grace and balance. And on the right, you're looking at the famous uh, um, Nike of San Mathres, and she's an interpretation. We don't have a head, but there was a head, and there were arms. But she is that beauty of um, balance and perfection. And of course, the one thing that I want you to remember is that this particular sculpture was well known. It wasn't in the Louvre, but notice how the arms are over the head. It's the come on pose. It's uh, repeated over and over again. We have it in the Demoiselle for sure. And this is called the Ariadne pose. So I'll, if you remember that for me, then I'll be able to uh, repeat uh, that, uh, that name over and over again. So this is Ariadne who was waiting on Naxos because she's been jilted by Theseus. That's a great story. <laughs> Ask me about it later. So but let's keep on with these beautiful nudes, the ones that are best known, whether or not uh, Picasso had known them in person or whether or not they were known through reproduction. But it's the Sleeping Venus by Giorgione. It's the Venus of Urbino by uh, Titian. And this Titian, uh, we usually bring up, and you have it here in the show. Thank you very much, Janie, because I thought this is out, this may be off the charts. But we do recognize that the position of Diana, this is Diana and her nymphs. Now, we've had the nude who is alone, and she's recumbent. She's lying down, and she's available. And we have these nudes who are usually a bunch of nymphs. They are supposedly followers of Diana. They're virgins and so forth. And it's just an opportunity for some cheesecake. And this painting probably was uh, known to Manet. But what I'm bringing in here is it doesn't necessarily have to be a nude. It can also be a woman who's clothed, but she's in an environment that's considered exotic. So we have the classical nudes who are goddesses, and we have the exotic women, the odalisques. In this particular instance, it was always considered an odalisque, and now it's been re-identified as Esther from the Book of Esther. So side by side, they are. And uh, the whole thing right now is to consider how did, with my history of the Demoiselle, how did Picasso start to imagine himself entering into the pantheon of these great uh, artists in terms of his own time? Well, first of all, we have evidence that he certainly is aware of the Olympia, and he set it on its head. As you can see, he's got these two fellows. On the uh, your left side, it's probably Casajemas, who was alive in 1901, and then you have Picasso, who's a young fellow, who's on the right side. And remember that, I hope you remember, that um, when we're looking at the Olympia, it's a white woman and the maid is, is um, African. So here we have the African sort of a combination of the two. So he's certainly after transgressive ideas for art. The other thing, too, possibly this was sketched after he finished the Demoiselle, but we know that he looked at the, Olymp uh, the Odalisque, so this certainly speaks to it, and it's done in the sort of angular uh, painting that we see in the Demoiselle. Another painting from 1906, and this is really the point when uh, Salmon reports to us, he starts to think in terms of the Demoiselle. So in Salmon's imagination, did he consult with Picasso? I don't think so. He decided that he would start the Demoiselle's evolution in 1906, and I think this particular sketch would speak to it. 
Another thing that's most important is this particular Paul Cézanne belonged to Henri Matisse. And I think you know that Henri Matisse and Picasso had this friendly rivalry. So naturally, Picasso went over to visit Henri and he said, oh, wow, so you've got that Cézanne. How did you get hold of that? And he bought it off of Vollard on time, you know, a little at a time. So you can imagine Picasso thought, he's got a Cézanne and I don't. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to steal from it. I'm going to take a part of it. So what we probably are looking at on the lower right side, you can see the nude who is in that crouched sitting position. That possibly she is the influence on the figure in the demoiselle who's on the extreme right uh, lower corner. And the other women too. But we've got plenty of Cezannes that we can choose that might have been influencing this particular combination that we have in the Demoiselle. You have the woman who's entering in this particular large bathers, which belongs to London. And then there are several other, other uh, Cezannes that might have been the source. Cezanne dies in 1906, and that's significant because when he dies, there's a tremendous sense of nostalgia now. He's been studied for years, but as you know, with his death, there's memorials, there's more opportunities to make an effort to look at his work. And so as Henri Matisse said, he was our father. They were looking towards Cézanne, and most of the artists of this group, Picasso, Cézanne, Durand, you'll see him too, uh, that uh, Cézanne became um, a, a kind of, uh, person to emulate. So they went through a period which you call Cezanisma, the, the period of following Cezanne. And that's about 1906-7-8. So here we go. This is in 1906. We're looking at Henri Matisse's The Joy of Life, Honor de Vivre. And the point for you to see is that it's about this bucolic setting with nudes. So uh, when we think of Henri Matisse, he's looking at Cezanne in terms of the classical tradition. You have the nudes in uh, a setting that isn't particular. It seems as though it's taking place in uh, perhaps an idyllic or imagined setting, but it isn't taking place in a brothel. This particular painting was shown in 1907. And we think that Picasso already started working on his Demoiselle. This would have been shown in May. That was when they had what was called the Salon des Indépendants, the Independence. It was not a juried show. It was usually the new art that was uh, challenging the old guard. And in this particular instance, when we have Henri Matisse with this blue nude, and that in and of itself was uh, pretty racy for people. They didn't think she was pretty. They, they felt that there was something strange about the way this um, sketch that was behind her backside looked as though it was growing out of it. It, it, it received a lot of criticism. So when someone says we were already used to the idea of uh, taking on the nude in, in uh, unusual ways, uh, that in the deformed ways is what he says exactly, um, it, it means this particular Matisse and this Durand. In 1907, Durand was the big cheese. He was the leader, and everybody felt that he was going to take the mantle as the great artist of the French tradition, Samuel included. And we see in 1906, these artists who were avant-garde, they were inventing these new forms, they were going to uh, other sources that were non-traditional, not French. In this particular instance, the influence could be, you could say, um, Medieval art, it looks very similar to things that come out of uh, the Carolingian tradition. If you're taking art history, you know what I'm talking about. It's Charlemagne's period. Or it looks as though it's an interpretation of primitive art. Another, uh, and the wild colors identify it as part of the fauve movement. The fauves are about these crazy colors. And the next year, he comes back after his so-called Cezanne summer in 1907, and he gives us these bathers. And remember, they're identified as bathers, so they're still in the tradition of something that goes along with Diana and her nymphs. That's OK. And uh, they seem to be angular, and they seem to have these weird colors, so it's still identified as something coming out of the fauves. But it's, it's changing direction into what we consider to be that angularity that uh, Cezanne introduced to the young artists. 
Another artist you may not have heard of, but he was pretty well known in his time. And this is Autant Frise, and he also was a possible leader. I know, you're probably thinking, I never heard of him. But, you know, he had a chance. And so he was a contender. 1907, and you can see he too is painting bathers. So notice that if Picasso wanted to do it nicely, if he wanted to play along with his friends, he would have chosen a painting of nudes. Maybe they wouldn't have been the classical nudes, but they would have been bathers. They would not have been brothel, the denizens. Another very big influence, we think, is this particular painting that belonged to a friend of his, a fellow whose name is Ignacio Zuluaga. And this was in Zuluaga's studio home. And we know from letters that Picasso would have dinner with his girlfriend at the time, Fernand Olivier, and because they had very little food at the time, and they were starving, and they knew that they could depend on a meal at this fellow's house from time to time. Naturally, they, he would have a front row seat to studying this El Greco, which uh, has been identified, I'll call it the ap apocalypse in this particular lecture. It's been identified as having many different possibilities, the opening up the seventh seal. It belongs to the Metropolitan right now, and uh, so it migrated there. But at the time, he was able to study it. And we see the colors, uh, the use of tonalities, perhaps the arrangement of some of the figures, the large figure on the extreme left. And uh, so there's a lot of these, uh, uh, I would say, influences that are within Picasso's purview. And not the least of all, these postcards of brothel scenes. And these were around and, and accessible. And this particular one I selected simply because she's got the pose of the women in the center where her head is, you know, he, she's got the hand that goes behind the head. It's the Ariadne pose. And you can also see the curtain. So it gives you a sense of uh, the uh, features that he decided to make a brothel like with the women who pose in the center of the room. They come in in order to be selected. And then you have the curtains, which are put off on the sides, and they probably are on the doorways. Another influence that we know in 1906, Picasso went to Gozol in Spain. And in Gozol, there were uh, the heads that belonged to the tradition that we call the classical Iberian tradition. There was an exhibition also at the Louvre of this tradition. And he was able to acquire, through um, an associate of a friend of his, Guillaume Apollinaire was the poet, and he had a secretary whose name was Jerry, and this secretary had a habit of stealing things from the Louvre. So one day, he says, well, I'm going to the Louvre. Can I pick you up something? And he did. <laughs> so Picasso had purchased these hotheads. And uh, by 1911, when there was the, the arrest of Apollinaire uh, implicated in the, um, the theft of the Mona Lisa, Picasso became very nervous about somebody discovering that he had these heads that were acquired in um, a criminal way. So he had to make a deal. We don't know exactly how this worked out. At one point, he put them into a sack, and he was going to throw them into the Seine. And then he came back. He didn't have the heart to get rid of them. So uh, our understanding is that he made a deal with a journal, the Paris Journal, in which he would give them back, and there would be no questions asked. But they were returned eventually. So he had in his possession these heads, and we see in the Elvis that the, that's there, that he could study, and they have the almond-shaped eyes, and those seem to be in the Don Guizel, as well as in Gozol, you've got a Romanesque style that has the big almond eyes, and he would have been able to see this Madonna, who, which belongs to a church. Another thing, of course, we talk about a lot is the influence of African art. And there's the story that he tells, whether it's apocryphal or true, that he goes to the Trocadero at the time the Musée de l'Homme. It was the 
ethnographic museum. And when he goes in, he's horrified. He feels as though, you know, at one point he's repulsed and it's very smelly, and then he feels, but he must go through. And he senses this is the land of the shamans. And I think that that is part of the demoiselle, the sense of acquiring a magical touch that he associated with African artists. So here I'm showing you one of the heads that uh, you have on the right in the demoiselle and comparing it to a mask. Another influence could be Gauguin. Gauguin dies in 1903, but his retrospective is in 1906, fresh uh, and, and easy to remember for uh, Picasso. And this particular strange creature, the um, Oviri, which was recently in, in the uh, Museum of Modern Art, so I could look at it close. It's very big. I always thought it was a tiny little thing, but it's actually quite large, quite scary looking, and it's supposed to be some kind of goddess and demon figure all rolled up into one. So I'm sure it attracted Picasso because it seemed to be full of something which was uh, um, maybe a little magical in itself. And then we have Durin. And remember, Picasso is very competitive. So with Durin, Durin's going into sculpture, and he's created a sort of primitivized appearance of the female nude. So we have the demoiselle, and we also have the photographs that we found in Picasso's collection. And these were discovered by Anne Baldessari, who was the director of the museum and was a curator for a show about Picasso and photography. And Janie Cohen has lectured to you on this and she's demonstrated it in the exhibition. So I hope that you have studied this well. In this particular instance, I'm quickly going through this where we have the, uh, the uh, thesis that this particular postcard was in the possession of Picasso. So this is, this is by the uh, photographer Forti. For, um, Fortier. And this, this is the thesis that Poldessari has, that she sees that there are similarities with these postcards or details in the postcards, and we find them in other paintings as well. So these, this is the set that is the Fortier set. And then Janie Cohen has introduced to you the idea that ethnographic photography in and of itself is full of, it's pregnant with ideas that belong to the, uh, the disposition of Parisians thinking of the exotic, thinking of how the um, people who come from different parts of the world look. And uh, Janie sees this is that if you see the formation that's often in these ethnographic photographs, and here she's introducing the Neretis, that we might imagine that Picasso is speaking through the arrangement, the particular arrangement we have in the Demoiselle in terms of ethnographic photographs. And he expects that the audience is going to uh, immediately recognize this as in, uh, an innuendo, if not uh, full of meaning, these exotic women. In addition, we have our historians who have decided that the peculiar faces, which we identify as masks, may also be a, sp a specific reference to syphilis. And so these are very disturbing faces, but it indicates, of course, that it was syphilis and the, um, the ravages of the disease on the face were, at that time, quite well known. But we go to these sketches, and I'm going to show you only a few. There are, what, what is it, Janie, 708, something? Yeah. That's, Hard to imagine. But Salmon, we're still channeling you, André. Uh, Salmon uh, tells us that he was there with Picasso and he would make these sketches over and over and over again. Uh, and, and he was doggedly at it. So one of the things I want to impress on you is that this painting was done with a great deal of labor. And as, as Salmon points out, labor that he had no idea would go anywhere. You know, and therefore, when you're working hard and you're, you're doing your studies and so forth at this wonderful school, remember that all of these great artists that went before you had to uh, work over and over and over again in order to arrive at something that they had no idea would go anywhere other than into, the uh, into their studios. And this particular uh, painting, I, I, it's in the show, this information, but this particular painting was finished in 1907, but it didn't exit 
from Picasso's studio until 1916. And so the people who saw it were invited to see it. And as we will see, even if you were invited, you may not be able to see the painting in its place. So these particular sketches, as you can see, it starts out naturalistically. It's important for you to imagine that this was the kind of uh, figure that he had in mind. And then he decides that he's going to create something rather narrative, and that is the, the uh, reproduction that we have in one of the first rooms. And the narrative, of course, is this momentum mori, the idea that uh, when you enter into the brothel, you take your life in your hands, and so these, this might have been a moralizing uh, decision at first that uh, he would have on the extreme left, you see this, uh, there's a fellow who's entering. We have the sketch so you can see him better, and he's holding um, a skull, which usually indicates death, and we say that he is a student, and the students at that time would come in and they would check out women who were in brothels, and, and there was some kind of registry, at least in Barcelona. So it might have been that kind of uh, idea that the student comes in and it's his job to remind everybody you know, the, the consequences for using the brothels. And then in the center, there's another fellow, and he's supposed to be the sailor. And we know that the Demoiselle d'Avignon is named after Avignon. It's, some people think that it's named after a brothel that was on Avignon, the uh, Carrère Avignon, which was the, bro the street of the brothels uh, down by the the uh, water and the soldiers would come and use the brothels. That may or may not be true. Samuel decided to give it the name in 1916 to simply disguise the fact that it was a brothel because, hard to imagine today, to say this word bordel in French in public was unacceptable. And therefore, the, while the group who were close to Picasso during this whole process of creating the work of art, knew very well was always about a brothel. This could not be revealed to the public when it became part of an exhibition. And then he made a very radical decision. He took out the men and arranged the women so that they would greet you. And they, so therefore, you become the customer. And that goes to the idea that we have in the Manet, that when you come upon the Olympia, you are being greeted by Olympia and by her maid. And those are fresh flowers, so you've just arrived. And you might be the sultan, as we see with La Grande Odalisque, that she's looking over her shoulder, and she's trying to give us the feeling that she's coy, but she knows why she's there. But these women are frontal. One woman comes in, as you can see from the left. She strides in almost as if to get ready for taking her place. And the woman whose legs are splayed open, as you can see behind you, Friedler did a great job with that, she may be sitting on a bidet. She is, it's very difficult to understand what are her intentions, or she's simply doing something which is a come on gesture. So the whole point at this stage is to simply reproduce what Picasso feels are the typical poses of the women who stand and get ready for selection. So this is um, an idea of what the first stage looked like. I found this in a book which is about the demoiselle. And it, of course we have no idea, but we're, we imagine all the heads at that point were what we call Iberian. They were the European heads. And even though on the left, the far left, you can imagine that's sort, of, uh, that's sort of influenced by Egyptian art. But for the rest of them, they simply were women who were arranged, maybe not great beauties in our opinion, but they did not have the masks. So we have to think about what is that mask thing that he decided to add on? So as Janie points out, the masks are added possibly in March possibly in July. We know that he worked on it. Uh, I'm giving you a timeline that's simply an impression. That he sees everything in January, he's working through all of his ideas, and by March, we have the women already set up as an, in this iconic position rather than the narrative. And then he goes to the ethnographic museum, which he claims he did in the spring. And that 
turns him on to something new. His idea of a brothel is transgressive. The paint and the uh, composition, the idea of having a shallow space, and this kind of style that seemed to come out of Fauvism but was his own take on it, that in and of itself could have been an outrageously demanding painting to digest. But when he put on these extra, what we call the masks, then there is that confrontation with what does he mean by these women? Who are they? Is this about the syphilis? Is this about connecting with African art? Or what I've contended is that, is this a comment on the whole inheritance of art history for Picasso's imagination to date? Which is to say that on the left side, we have a woman who wears a mask that reminds us of Egypt, because indeed he was thrilled with the Egyptians. But Salmon says then he puts the, uh, the African masters above the Egyptians. So we have in the center two women who represent the European tradition and in the Ariadne poses. And then we have a woman who enters, and she seems to have the mask, which I pointed out, is the African tradition. So they now enter into this circle and become part of the history of art that Picasso wants everyone to get and recognize and to appreciate that this is what he uh, belong, what he feels belongs to him. His tradition is European, Egyptian, and now African. And in addition, we have a kind of mask on the figure who is on the lower right that may be from the South Seas, what we call Oceana, and that would, of course, been the source for Gauguin. So he's including it, and he did acquire some of those pieces as well. So this becomes a sort of cosmology for his work of art, all of these influences that are brought to bear on the fundamental vehicle of the great tradition, the nude, the female nude, which we know in each case, whether we're talking about La Grande Odalisque or, or the Olympia, is at the very core of every accomplished artist in France. So now this is our um, story. This is our history. We start out on the left side looking at the first idea, the first iteration, which is to have a narrative with the men included. And then we take out the men, and you become the customers, and the women confront you. And then there are the masks. So that at the end of the day, as Salmon says, this idea of several different styles, several different traditions, everything coming together can only be a signal that the person who invented this work of art will be the great artist of the future. This is what Samuel knows, looking at a work of art that everyone who came into the studio could not bear to look at. And as a result, it was covered I think that Picasso, and I, other people have said this as well, he probably got tired of the jeers, got tired of having to answer to people making nasty comments. Um, we know that he didn't cover things, so it isn't because he was afraid of the dust. Um, so behind Salmon, who stands there, and at the time he's about 25, he's the same age as Picasso. Uh, Picasso they're, they're actually born in October. They're like brothers of October. Um, we're looking at him standing in front of the three women, which we have also in this show as a reproduction for you to study. And the paint, and behind, can you see that curtain? That is the demoiselle, hidden. What happened to the demoiselle? Well, it was taken out by Salmon in 1916 during World War I and was put into a show that had an, a, a number of the other artists, some of them, some of them I've already shown you, Durand, uh, Matisse were in it, and some people you don't know. Uh, the whole idea was to show what is going on in modern art. So it was called the, the modern effort 
uh, during World War I, and a lot of the artists, as you know, were at the front. So the whole idea was to simply keep people up with what Picasso, with uh, Salmon and Picasso and the avant-garde, Modigliani was in town. So it was on its own a, a radical show and was placed in, of all places, uh, a gallery that was next to the Couturier Poiret's uh, studio where you would get these fancy clothing. So it was all quite soigné. It was really up and up. Uh, but the point is that into this mix was another couturier, and that was Jacques Dusset. So Poiré has the show. We don't know, since I don't think that uh, Jacques uh, Dusset and Poiré, uh, Paul Poiré were the best of friends. They were, and they were also rivals, like Picasso and Matisse, looking at each other's work, but not really being bosom buddies. But we do know that Dusset was interested in the Demoiselle. And a few years later, this is 16, he doesn't purchase it until 1924, and he puts it, as you can see in this photograph, into his apartment in Neuilly, which is a really upscale neighborhood. And he tries to sort of gussy it up in, in this uh, Art Deco way. Picasso never went to see it. I think he was afraid he would find out that it was that not interpreted to his liking. But the in exterior to this, which I find fascinating, is that it was an orientalized motif. So there they are, the demoiselle in an orientalized deco setting um, with a lot of gold and brass. And then Doucet dies, and his wife decides that she, she can't stand this painting. She's going to get rid of it, and so she has it. Uh, she brokers her deal with an American, uh, deal, uh, an American gallerist, and it's sold to the Museum of Modern Art. It comes over here in 37, actually, and it's sold to the Museum of Modern Art in 1939. So you can see the trustees are standing there. And I find this really interesting. This is a painting that was covered in the studio because his friends couldn't bear to look at it. And now we have these really uh, well-dressed, up, uptown, um, sort of Upper East Side New Yorkers standing there proudly next to these whores. But let me tell you, a lot of people didn't know they were whores until Leo Steinberg came along in 1970 and told people. So they said, oh yeah, they're, they're demoiselles, they're girls, they're maidens, and they come from Avignon, that's in France. Okay, that's all we need to know. Um, but it's modern, it looks modern. It looks like it's surrealist, actually, and they were quite content that they were modern enough. This painting is now in the Museum of Modern Art looking just like that. And I chose this particular snapshot, I have several, in which you see a person who's looking at the painting through her smartphone. This is how the painting is now realized. You, you come up and then you take a photograph of it, the way it looks, done, and then you move on. So nobody even gives a care. It doesn't look as uh, scary, it doesn't look as perhaps offensive as it used to. It's simply, ah, oh, I went, Photographed is like the Mona Lisa of the Museum of Modern Art. Now, it's important for you, this is another snapshot I selected, and I'm so happy. Uh, I wanted you to see that the Damien Elways that we have here has a painting, which now is next to the museum. It was purchased by the Museum of Modern Art. So it is now in that room so that you can see all of the uh, paintings that are 1906. We have these two women that are on your left, and then on the right we have that uh, the, uh, the nude woman from 1908, just to the, her head. And this is the Damien Elway, so that you can see it, but uh, you have the painting here, so you should study it, you don't need a slide. All right, so what happens later? We've got Georges Braque, who's been frequenting Picasso's studio, and he says, oh, what do you want from us, Pablo? <laughs> <laughs> you want us to, uh, you have the, the quote here, you want us to drink gasoline and, and spit out fire. But then, of course, he has to take the baton and think, ah, I'll do my own nude. But she's a, a friendly nude. She may not be somebody that you would date, but he feels as though she's, she, she is, uh, he writes about this, she, he feels as though he's, he's expressed her beauty sufficiently. And we also have Max uh, Weber, but I'll say Weber because he is, German extraction, born here, actually in the United States, goes to Paris and he knows Picasso and so we are pretty sure that he saw the Demoiselle and he comes here. So his American name is Max 
Weber. And Summer, as you can see, in 1909, he certainly has, you know, he's drunk the Kool-Aid. We have the George Biddle here. And as you can see, there are various poses. And the poses can be seen as Demoiselle poses. Perhaps he saw that show in 1916. Or that there were the, uh, as you saw, uh, uh, um, Autant frise, I'm going to say it correctly. Autant frise, but just think autant. Um, that there was that desire to have a variety of different bathers that would be in the Cezanne-esque tradition. So here we have Europa, which is a classical story of Europa being taken away on the bull, this transformation of Jupiter. So he is a classical uh, artist who is painting in sort of modernist way. And then we have Stas um, Orlovsky, and Stas tells us that his painting was actually influenced by Biddle and by the Demoiselle, so that we have his interpretation of the various nudes, particularly taking that Ariadne pose. So that connects him to the classical tradition. It connects him to the early modernist tradition that we have uh, with the Biddle. And it also connects him to the Demoiselle. This painting, you have this painting and collage. And I have to tell you, and I forgot it was a collage. So that, as you can see, uh, slides are deceiving. So as I'm thinking about it, I, and I came here and I realized, oh, not a good visual memory, Beth. But the point is for you to recognize that we have, on the one hand, a classical tradition that is brought to us through Angre, uh, which I represented in the uh, Grand Odelisque. This one is the source. And so Mariani decided he would choose the source as his Ariadne kind of pose. And he places it next to the Demoiselle. The Demoiselle always seems to be on the mind of the artists from the moment that it appears in front of them all the way into um, our generation now to speak to it and to respond in some way, what do they get from it? And each of the artists here gets something else. In this particular instance, it is the thread, the idea that the artists have a thread which connect them from one generation to the next, from the classical tradition to the academic tradition, that's Ayangra, all the way into the modern tradition, which is Picasso. In uh, the painting, in the photograph that we have, which is really quite startling and came to my attention through Janie, is this Léonce Raphael, and I'm, help me, but it's uh, Agbo Julu. And he, uh, he comes from an area that he's identified in, this, uh, in the photograph as the Demoiselle of Porto Novo. And we have the idea that he's looked at the Demoiselle in terms of the mask and the uh, additive quality with the body. In uh, the artist's description, he's looking for the combination of the, uh, the colonial and how it is influencing or affecting the relationship of people who live in the culture and certainly the artistic tradition in, this cu in their culture, and that is very much on the mind of the artist in, in this particular combination. But if we have it as a dialogue between the Demoiselle and the photograph itself, it brings to mind the notion of those masks. And what Samuel had said is, it is about that mask. Those masks, it's a little sentence and it means a lot. Those masks dehumanized the women. This was part of the strategy, this dehumanization. And why Picasso had decided on dehumanizing the female nude, the sacred female nude, was in and of itself the greatest transgression, the greatest shock of this particular painting when it first appeared in 1907. This is a wonderful combination that is painted, that is a photograph, it's a diptych by one of the students, uh, an alum at the University of Vermont. And we're taking a look at an artist's perception of the gaze. 
On the left side, we're looking at a woman who seems to be a combination of what we think of the cubist. It's the full face and it's the side view all smooshed together. But she's not looking at us, actually. And the camera, the mechanism is, it has the eye, this mechanical eye, which does look at us. And so there's this sort of uh, dialogue between the two, the, fe the female nude uh, the female figure not giving us her attention, and yet the attention, of course, is dedicated to us from the camera. Um, an artist who is in here, these are paintings that belong to collections far away. This is Robert uh, Kalkos, uh, Colescott, and this is two different, these are two different paintings, they're separate. I just put them on one uh, PowerPoint slide. The nude, these are in the Demoiselle d'Alabama. Uh, one is the nude and one is uh, the clothed. And the whole idea here, of course, is to think about the Demoiselle in terms of vernacular. What is the vernacular of the uh, particular painting belonging to the French tradition and everything that I've told you so far? And now we bring it into a kind of hillbilly vernacular that belongs to the American tradition on the left. And on the right, of course, if you take the clothes off, it starts to change the whole uh, atmosphere entirely. Notice, of course, there are people who are of different skin tones. I'm not going to say race because I don't believe in race. I think that there are different skin tones, and therefore it brings to bear whether or not you're going to buy into the theories that the domicile should be read as African as opposed to uh, European. And with that said, we've got an artist whose name is Patrick Caulfield, and he decides to play on it by having your view of the demoiselle, not confronting you, but behind. And so that is exactly what it says. It's the uh, demoiselle viewed from behind, from 1999. And then we have Elaine M. Foti, and she's the one who, this is um, women from uh, Africa, and so she's the uh, artist, uh, I would say, who is thinking about the demoiselle in terms of the scholarship, the contemporary scholarship. This is 1907 to celebrate the 100th uh, birthday of the demoiselle. But the scholarship up to that point had put a lot of weight on reading the demoiselle as women who come from uh, an African background and the colonialist overtones, and, and that's a thesis uh, that uh, Patricia Layton believes in. But in this particular instance, what you see are women from different parts of Africa, from Northern Africa, from Ivory Coast, and uh, women who um, you can see are professional and women you can see are uh, covered over entirely from the Islamic tradition. So all of this is a commentary on women. In it. I think it's a rather feminist uh, statement itself. And here in the show, we have Kathleen Gillia's Demoiselle, uh, again, celebrating. This was created for a show to celebrate the Demoiselle at 100. And these two particular women are what Kathy decides to do, restore, in, the, in this case, the real women who would have posed for Picasso if indeed he had real women in front of him at any time. And she's chosen full-figured women, women who are naturalistic rather than uh, just the classical nude. In order to remind you that the, the people behind the demoiselle who would inspire a demoiselle for Picasso and all of the bathers and everything we've seen were alive. They were models. They, they had um, their own uh, minds, their, their own bodies, and their own sense of being in this world. And therefore, she restores, rather than uh, Picasso dehumanizing, she restores the humanity of these, the women who were uh, behind the, uh, the, the original ideas for the nude, for Picasso. And so we Matisse decided to take them out entirely. We do have what appears to be, I've got it right here, this residual sense of the a woman who is leaning in a sitting recumbent pose. I always feel as though she, it'll finally come into focus. But she's decided to take the women out of what we, uh, I, I can identify as, as the background in order to say that through absence, we remember presence. That is her strategy. And we have Jerry Davis, her bordel here. And this one, of course, you know is really tri quite transgressive because she's taken on the demoiselle in terms of male, uh, a person that she sees as a Picasso type. This is a model who uh, she felt looked similar to Picasso, and so she hired him. And she, has, uh, she had imposed a 
variety of different ways and overlaps each of these poses, in order for you to think about taking on the history of art, taking on particularly the great masters of art. So as she made her transition from being an architect to an artist, she decided she would take on the greatest art work she could think of, which was the Demoiselle, and she would reiterate it in, in the way that she felt uh, expressed her sense of uh, what the painting meant to her in all of its uh, challenges, not only painting it, but the poses and, and, a, and certainly the characterization of taking the women out and replacing it with men, a Picasso man. It's her vengeance, I think. And we have the Friedler, which, as you can see, this the ones that you have here are one uh, type of Demoiselle that he created. He has, I think, uh, various iterations as well. So uh, this is the one that um, I saw in Manhattan, uh, in which it's, it has the colors that are similar to the ones that you find on the painting. And of course, I think it speaks to the whole painting and Picasso and his opinion of the painting too. And maybe women. Maybe he's channeling what women think of, Pica of Picasso's painting as well. And so this is the final slide. And of course, this is what Picasso's Demoiselle, that uh, difficult, prickly painting that drove everybody crazy when it was first uh, put into his studio. And it now becomes, to my way of thinking, this icon of modernism. We're not bothered by it so much as it is a logo, it's a label, it's a brand. And so here we are, the branding for uh, a poster about cubism. And we're not even sure it's a Cubist painting, but that's another lecture. And we have it, I think this is wonderful, the Senegal stamp. It's on a mug. I think you can get this on eBay. So look for it. And finally, of course, it's on a poster for the Museum of Modern Art. It, it, they're like the mascots for the Museum of Modern Art. What an irony that we have here, that we started out with these women who were considered hideous and ugly and, uh, and unspeakable, and most people wouldn't speak of her, of them. And we turn into a, a society in which they're, they're quite acceptable. In fact, they are what we call the cornerstones of modern art. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? Please. Did, it, did I go over? Okay. <laughs> Very thorough. Thank you. I have something to add to this group. Sure. Um, I had seen this in the New York Times Magazine, and then a friend had also given it to me. It was a spread on interior decorating, and it was talking about how beige is like the newest thing. This was last year, I think, in the spring. You know, beige was like a new, fresh interior color. And there was a tapestry of Demoiselle. And I never knew that actually, it, whether that there was actually a full size tapestry, well, a tapestry. of, of wow. the painting. But it was hanging on the wall in this living room in which everything was upholstered in beige. And so the whole point of it was beige, you know, which is again, I, love this. This. <laughs> the, you know, I mean, the absolute opposite. I'll give you a copy of it. Too. Oh, you must. This is every artist's yeah. nightmare. Right. That it matches the sofa. The sofa. That's all that it, it, their it's painting true. is about. It it's matches true. the sofa. It's true. I can't tell you how many artists have asked me not to sell their work. So that's of that. the nadir for Jim Moselle. Isn't it, though? Yeah. But, but, but also that it didn't bother them the way it looks. I mean, right, it, right, you know, right. it, it's just OK as long as it matches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next lecture. <laughs> Interior decorating. Yes. Can you say something about the Senegal uh, stamp? I I can't quite understand why they would do that. I don't need, I don't know either. <laughs> That's the reason why I found it so fascinating. That, that because it when we talk about it, all the words that are a part of this exhibition and all of the scholarship, it's outrageous, it's outrageous. And then it's benign. When you have it on a stamp and you stamp it on top of it, it seems as though it's just turned into uh, something as um, sort of playful or, or, or um, curious or, or something 
that you coexist with, like puppies, usually, uh, really, uh, the, it seems to tame it in a way that I find actually too bad that we've, we've made it, we've domesticated it rather than kept it as something which is wild and unacceptable. This was the 50th anniversary of the Moselle. It's from 67. Ah. But I do know that Picasso is, is quite big in Senegal um, and that there are some kind of uh, more contemporary or artists who came of age in the 50s and 60s and 70s who really look to his work. So I don't, I don't know. Thank you, and I didn't know that. And when you think 67, because he's quite alive. He's, yeah, yeah, he's, he's kicking, right. so that's that right. means he's still the great that's master. Right. But it's interesting they would choose this particular work. Yeah. Hmm. That I don't know why. Yes? Two things that are related. Given what you showed of what was happening at the same time, how radical some of it is. I was surprised that people were really that freaked out by this. But even more, given Picasso's personality, I'm surprised that he just didn't care. And he hid it for 10 years or so before he showed it again. You would think that he would say, I don't give a shit. I mean, <laughs> oh, he did? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think he didn't care that people didn't like it or that people you know, really reigned insults on him about it because he made it and he was happy with it and he moved on. The thing is, the anecdotal history of Cubism takes this particular painting as the beginning of Cubism and moves forward into the whole history of what happens with the exhibitions that follow. So the whole uh, chapter really isn't about the Dumoiselle. It simply wants to point out in Salmon's opinion, this was the very beginning. This was this illuminated the fire for Cubism. Uh, that today, of course, can be debated because it's a Fauvist painting that has a lot of Africanist and, and other stuff in it too. Uh, so for Picasso, who's been there, done that, I'm done, and then he moved forward with the experiments in Cubism. His mind was so fertile; it was, and and I think he couldn't stay still. It, so once he finished the Demoiselle, and then he probably had already decided the three women would be the next idea, and all of the paintings that are around that particular work, Picasso and the, uh, the three women, there's just so much that he's working on. So for us, we make a big deal about it because it's in a museum, and as you can see, it's, so, it's, it's separated out with the white walls, and you know it has that kind of uh, respect. But it starts out in this dirty little basement as an experiment. Anyone else? Over here. Okay. Uh, just was wondering about the fruit. When did that arrive? <laughs> oh, the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I'm glad you mentioned the fruit, because it's important to notice, we, we think what we're looking at, and that's also debated, um, we're looking at a watermelon or something which is sort of a vaginal thing, but in the earlier iterations it was a praron, and the praron is, do you know what that is? You drink, it's a Spanish kind of vessel. You put the wine in it, and you tip it up in such a way. You have to have skill. It's a very Spanish way of, I guess, manhood. And you're going to tip it up, and you, the spout will not go to your lips. You get it so that it, it's like a fountain. It's going to come right into your mouth. And they think of it as something that's so phallic and, and such a machismo kind of thing that, you, that you're supposed to master as a good Spanish person. And that, naturally, when you have it in place in, in, in full view with these women who belong to the brothel, it speaks about everything. The mastery of the women and you know the whole pleasure and, and of course with the fruit and everything, it's all about their succulent bodies and blah, blah, blah. Yes, anyone else? Just how many yes. high school kids don't realize that every connection with modern art when they do this with it? Water bottles. So. <laughs> <laughs> You'll tell them now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yes. Uh, and actually, in the the early drawing with the sailor and the student, yes. the sailor yes. is holding that. In the oh, so that's his machismo. Yeah. It's his. Yeah, yeah. that speaks yeah. to his. Yeah, his power. Thank you. Yes. Not a question, just a comment. Your presentation really. Yes. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. 
Thank you very much. I really, this is such a great show. I didn't feel, I got, in, I got here and I thought, oh, it's all here. There's no need to repeat. It's, it's all done right here. It's a great show. And it's a, it's a lot of fun to interact with the show. I think from the point of view of museology, it's really outstanding. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming.